Hello, everyone. I'm Sean McBride, reporting live from the Man Cave in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. And today I'd like to take you on a journey, a journey back to 2015. 2015 was a year of some pretty momentous anniversaries, one of which was the fifth anniversary of the creation of Node.js, the year where the IOJS fork and the joint Node.js branch merged back together, reconciliation. It was also the year of the 50th anniversary of the IBM mainframe. And so today I'd like to talk a little bit about bringing the technologies of today and tomorrow to the platforms that host a lot of the legacy applications of yesterday and today. I'm gonna to talk about Node.js on the mainframe. So I'd like to share my screen. Okay, Node.js on the mainframe. Um, and sp specifically, this is presented for folks that aren't familiar with what a mainframe is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but move along pretty quickly. Um, and then of course, I've got the obligatory JavaScript, all the things, because I think it's what, Atwood's law, everything must be rewritten in JavaScript if it's possible to do so. And Node.js on the mainframe allows us to push that just a little bit further. Okay, um, so why might you care about this topic if you're never gonna touch a mainframe? Because probably most of you are never gonna touch it. And this is just like a weird oddball kind of hobby for me. Um, a couple of thoughts on that. So the first, first of all, you know, you're often working on 64-bit Intel uh, processor architectures. And there's a lot of goodness there. A lot of stuff is super automated um, and a lot of abstractions kind of protect you from things. Once you move to other architectures, that's not the case. So I kind of, I know Netflix has this concept of like the chaos monkey where this piece of software breaks your systems running in production randomly. And when you move to something that's a little unfamiliar, um, like working on a mainframe or working on a Raspberry Pi or something, you'll find that kind of effect. Um, universal is less universal than you might think. So Node.js is a runtime for JavaScript. It's also a runtime for C++ code written as called uh, Node.js native extensions. And theoretically, it's supposed to recompile out of the box. That's not necessarily the case. And when you move to another micro, uh, micro processor architecture, you kind of discover that. Um, and, you know, we're moving in a world where there's all sorts of architectures, um, microcontrollers and things like that. So you might find yourself working on something with a different processor architecture than you're currently used to. And then finally, you know, schadenfreude can be pretty hilarious. And I tried to do a lot here and it, a lot of it just didn't work out. So you can kind of point and laugh a little bit and well, I'll, I'll laugh about it too. So when I started off working on this, this is kind of what I was, was thinking of. So the processor architecture for the mainframe today is called S390X for the 64-bit systems 390 architecture. And I kind of had this thoughts about what it would it be if I could if I could be the person that popularizes Node.js in the mainframe. I'd be the hero. I'd save all these legacy apps. I could be the master of mainframe. And then plus, you know, there aren't many people operating in this space. Maybe I could open up a little consultancy, work for some Fortune 500 companies, pay off my mortgage, you know? Um, and so that's kind of what I was thinking going into this, but really what it turned out to look like is more like this. So now leaving the happy path. So most everyone else is on X64 moving along in the bright, shiny sun of open source software. And then I moved over to the S390X architecture and it was just, it was tough. Okay. And so Basically, now I'm going to attempt to break down what a mainframe is in like 40 seconds. Totally impossible. We can talk offline. People on the internet can hit me in the comments if you have questions. Um, so basically, a, a mainframe is a specialized type of server. Physically, imagine two refrigerators side by side with water cooling, tons and tons of processors, looks super scary like a bat computer and that's basically a mainframe could have like a bunch of processors bunch of io and the idea is you have this this single supercomputer looking thing with tons of fiber optics plugged in and you've got something like the visa financial uh management network running on like two of these things so instead of having a bunch of um scale out architectures you have a couple of these monster mainframe computers uh, the, the processing architecture has gone back to 1964 and pretty much has backwards compatibility going to there. So when you're working in mainframes, you're in legacy land. You've got COBOL, 
shout out to Grace Hopper. You got PL1. You got all sorts of other things. You got all sorts of different architectures and, and things that kind of kind of might surprise you. And it's just extremely different from uh, kind of what we work on day to day. So I've got two parts here. First part, I'm going to talk a little bit about running Node.js on, on Linux on the mainframe. Specifically, that's Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.2, I believe. Um, and this is kind of uh, an architectural diagram of what it looks like. So you can see at the bottom, you've got a specialized mainframe hypervisor running virtualized operating systems. On the left side, you have something called ZOS, which is, is basically where a lot of those legacy applications live. On the right, you're running Linux, and it basically works pretty much just like Linux uh, on, on your standard servers or on your workstation. And so I'm running the Node.js runtime there. Um, but running it on the same physical hardware provides some cool advantages. One of them is this concept of, of a mainframe called hypersockets, where you can do TCP IP communications at memory speed through basically like a, like a virtual interface. And that allows you to have some, some really cool use cases where you can, you can basically treat a legacy app as a black box, wrapper some JavaScript around it to create some really cool real-time um, like Node.js APIs and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and do a live demo now. Hopefully this will work and the demo gods will smile on me. So here on the left is a application that some of the full stack folks in the audience will recognize. Folks on the internet, this is one of the final applications uh, that we created as, as students at full stack. It's called Juke and it's basically a, um, a clone of Spotify. Um, and so currently this is running on Linux on the mainframe. So I can go ahead and click. I can play music that you probably can't hear. And you can see here on the right, here's all the routes uh, happening on Linux on the mainframe. And for the most part, it's working pretty good. Um, so let me go ahead and, and prove to you that I'm not just running this on a AWS server or something like that. So if I go LS CPU, uh, you can see some different kind of nifty things about the processor. Notice. IBM S390, ZVM63, S390X architecture, and this, this crazy thing, Big Endian. You can, you can write that down, Google it later if you want, but the point is this is like crazy computer stuff, way different than, than normal. But here's um, Juke running on it. And um, kind of cool, uh, running Node version 6.9.2, which I hope is in the long-term support cycle. Anything on the mainframe should be long-term support. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So uh, the, the act of getting uh, this application work on the mainframe was actually quite a bit of work. I had to take Postgres 9. I think it's 9.6 from source, recompile it for the architecture. I had to go through the source tree uh, of the dependencies for Juke and identify C++ code and make sure things were recompiling right. It was, it was honestly like six hours of work. So if, if you're gonna like look at trying to take an application and, and move it to a new, architect, new, new type of processor architecture, expect that the deployment's gonna have some serious hiccups um, and just be aware of that. Okay, so that's that. So part two is, Node.js on ZOS, the most serious operating system out there, most serious operating system in the Fortune 500. And because it's so serious, I'm going to go ahead and put on my hard hat. So when you install the mainframe in a data center, you usually get one of these hard hats and it's just kind of a fun prop. Okay, so back to full screen. How do I do it? I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, anyway, going forward. So here's the uh, deployment architecture now. So before we had Node running in this Linux area, but now we're running in the Unix subsystem. Surprise, surprise, ZOS has a Unix subsystem inside of it. It's going to look a heck of a lot weird for folks used to like Ubuntu and stuff like that. 
um, some advantages of running in this environment. So now that you're running on top of ZOS, you have access to C++ language environment runtime. So you can do all sorts of really nifty things. Here's kind of a diagram showing all these, these different pieces. Since IBM um, did the work to create these C++ libraries, there's the possibility, not yet implemented, mind you, that in the future, um, this could be implemented as a Node.js native extension, and then uh, basically called directly like you would anything else. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to demo a couple of things here. This is super pre-alpha. I've been working with a couple of IBM distinguished engineers on it, so hopefully it works, who knows? Um, Okay, here we go. All right. All right, here we are inside the mainframe. All right, so let's go ahead and see what kind of tools we have. Do we have Emacs? Nope, we don't have Emacs. Do we have Nano? No Nano. Okay, let's go to Vim. No Vim. Oh no. What am I going to do? Yeah. So in the uh, Bash environment on Unix system services, it's basically like 1970s AT&T Unix. It's like such a minimal kind of subset. If you want to have Vim or anything like that, you have to basically pull the source in, recompile from source. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, so I have just a couple of things I'd like to show here. So um, first of all, let's do this. Uh, we're running version 0.12.17, which I actually think is out of support, I believe. Uh, so this is an ancient version of Node. Hopefully it's going to get updated um, moving forward. Let's see, PSEF, just to show kind of the processors running. I only have three, three processes running, which is like tiny compared to like an Ubuntu Linux distribution. And so finally, I let, fingers crossed that it's going to work out here. I wrote a tiny little uh, Node.js program here, kind of based on the first project that we did at full stack, like the choose your own adventure thing. So npm start. Okay, here we go. Fingers crossed. <gasps> Maybe. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, we got ASCII art. Okay. Um, and so as implemented, I have basically a little choose your own adventure thing. Um, so welcome to Node.js on ZOS. Do you want to use NPM, FTP, or SSH to install your Node application? Um, I don't know. Let's try NPM. Uh-oh. We hit an error. And that's because I wasn't able to get NPM installed here. I don't have actual network access to the internet or anything. So what, what now? Okay, let's restart our application. Okay, you know, maybe maybe let's try using FTP. I like to use that to copy files. Um, Uh-oh, whoops. We are not actually on a machine that uses the ASCII character encoding. So if we send FTP files, you can't even read it on here. Okay, well, what the heck? How am I going to make this work? Okay, finally, let's try SSH, and let's use our, our fancy binary mode. Okay, and it worked great. So now, now... I just have a menu where you can learn about some different basic IBM mainframe subsystems and things. Very, very compelling stuff. This is one of the best node applications I've ever seen, I think. So, you know, finally, um, here's like a grab bag of lessons learned, lots of text on here. Sorry about that. So, you know, as modern web developers, we kind of live in the golden age of developer productivity. It's great, it's great but we kind of get spoiled a little bit in certain ways. And so when you work on these kind of bleeding edge projects, you might be shocked that you're back to 1970s Unix mode. And I think that there's some value in being able to operate in that kind of environment and bring the tools and compile from source and things like that. Um, so for the most part, Linux is Linux, uh, but you know, Unix is kind of the weird uncle of Linux and it's quite a bit different. And when you move to a new processor architecture and bring C++, it can be a little complicated. I mentioned recompiling from source. That's a pain. And those C++ uh, like recompiles, they took like 10 minutes. I can make lunch. I can make a sandwich that whole time. Um, and then the systems administration is hard. Networks are pretty finicky. So that's, that's pretty much it. If you're feeling confused, 
that's good because boy, I'm pretty confused. Uh, but I do have a couple of resources to recommend. If you want to learn more about the IBM mainframe, there is a no cost IBM master of the mainframe kind of MOOC thing where you get systems access, you get to write COBOL applications and do all sorts of neat things. And I think more interesting to the Node audience is that you can get a free uh, Red Hat or SUSE Linux guest on an IBM mainframe for 90 days if you go to that link. It's pretty quick, one day turnaround. And if you want to process or to, you want to go ahead and practice recompiling C++ on a foreign architecture and have your mind blown, that's a great way to do it. So that's pretty much everything. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, that was so good.